Good morning. Well, you know, I'm, I'm always surprised to see how many of you make it up this early here. You know, I know it's been a short night. Well, a long night, short night, depending how you look at it. Um, it's, it's great to see you here. Are you ready for one more day of fantastic sessions? Yeah. Today will be a little bit shorter than the other days. I think everybody is, uh, is running out a little bit of energy. Well, not, apparently not yet, but uh, we know that you know, things slow down a little bit. And so we're going to have the closing session this afternoon. The closing session is the place to be if you want to know where the next European conference will be. It's also the place to be if you want to know what percentage of the people in this room are coming from your country. It's going to be a very exciting moment. And then after that, uh, we are going to have a break. And in the evening at 9 o'clock, we're going to come back in this room for the Drupal Trivia Night. The Drupal Trivia Night, if you, uh, if you haven't been there before, it's a, it's a DrupalCon tradition. It's organized by uh, Drupal Ireland. And it's, a, well, a lot of fun. And you get to win prizes. You get to win books, t-shirts, lots of stuff. Um, but in case you don't know that much stuff about Drupal and you might not get uh, to win a book, at the Drupal Trivia Night, we also have the bookstore downstairs. Who here has been at the bookstore? Okay, oh, you know, a good amount of people. I, I, I was worried that, you know, it's a small room there. Uh, most people might not be aware of it, but there's a lot of the major Drupal books that are in the market that you can buy there. They're cheaper than what you can get online. I mean, it's cheaper than Amazon.com with free delivery. Um, and it's all the all the, the money uh, goes uh, goes directly to the to the people who made these books. So it's it's definitely um, it's definitely a, a, a good deal there. One thing uh, that happened yesterday uh, is Moshe in this room. It must be somewhere. I I, I don't know. Uh, so y y I think most people know uh, Moshe uh, Weizmann. He forgot his eyeglasses in the Cuvillier uh, room. So if anybody found them yesterday after the last session, um, make sure to get them back to him or get in touch with us, and we'll get them to him. There's another person who also lost something, and this was a little bit more unfortunate, uh, because apparently a laptop was stolen yesterday. Um, we have a very open community. It's we have a lot of friendly people, but unfortunately, there are some people who still do that, uh, who still do that kind of things. So if, if you took that laptop and you feel like, you know, maybe you should return it, please do. And everybody else, please make sure that you keep an eye on your belongings. Uh, we have a lot of people here. Uh, there's people coming in and out. Um, yeah, keep an eye. Tomorrow, the conference, well, the, the sessions are, are going to be over, but uh, we are going to have the contribution sprint. Contribution sprint has been, uh, has been described by some people as the most valuable part of DrupalCon, because you really get to work hands-on with the top experts in the Drupal world on Drupal core, on the future of Drupal. It's also a great way to get involved. If you have never written a Drupal core patch, if you are not sure what the procedure is like, if you are not sure how to work with Git, there is a dedicated team that is going to walk those of you who want to get involved but don't know exactly how. They are going to walk you through the, all the steps. It's, again, it's a lot of fun. It's a very nice atmosphere, and it's also going to be right here in this room. I think I covered most of the things, and now we can go to the topic that everybody uh, is, is here for, uh, the keynote. For the keynote, we're going to do the same thing that we did yesterday for the questions. We are going to ask them on Twitter using the hashtag AskFab. 
And something that um, I didn't mention yesterday is that there's two people who are collecting uh, these, these questions. Um, these people are people that you've been interacting with in a way or another without knowing it. So we have Paul Johnson, who's at the back of the room there, and he's been doing all, of, all the things that have to do with social media for DrupalCon. He's been the one behind the at DrupalCon account, been a doing a fantastic job, and he's going to be the one collecting those questions, uh, putting them together in collaboration with Joost Dugprijda, who is the lead of our content team. So he's been coordinating all the track chair meetings uh, and a lot more. Um, and he will be the one to come on stage again to ask those questions to Fabien. Fabien Potencier is, to most of us, he's known as the Frenchman who created the Symphony project. So he is in indeed French, and he has let me know before when we were setting things up that he is also very attentive to his hairstyle, and he said that he is very interested in testing out um, some very strong industrial strength putty that uh, there's been some rumors about. So Dries, please get in touch with Fabien. I think there's some pot potential for uh, common ventures there. But at the same time, well, you know, most of all, Fabien is a passionate entrepreneur. He's someone who fell in love with open source software as a way to change the world. Please help me welcome Fabien Potencier. Guten Morgen, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome to my session. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to speak today at my second Drupal conference. Uh, Drupal conferences are very impressive for me, um, probably because, you know, so, m so many people here in the room, so many people excited about and committed to Drupal. That, that's really awesome. So as you might know, I'm, I'm the creator of uh, Symfony, which is a, a PHP web framework. Um, and you might, as you might know now, Drupalet is going to use some of the Symfony components. So if you don't like this change, I'm the one to blame. And if you like the direction Drupalet is taking, which I hope, really, uh, then you will probably still, still be able to blame me at some point when you, know, when you hit the first bug in Drupal 8, which is obviously related to Symfony. Um, and I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm quite serious. Um, I mean, you know, for the low-level architecture of Drupal, now you can rely on other developers, on another community, and I think that that's great. And, and of course, um, Symfony will probably also benefit a lot from, you know, Drupal and, and the Drupal community. But that, that's not the topic for today. I'm not going to talk about Drupal. I'm not going to talk about Symfony. I'm not going to talk about PHP. Of course, a lot of the examples I'm going to uh, talk about today are, are more or less related to these technologies. Um, and at the end of the session, you will be able to ask any questions. And please, if you have questions related to Symfony or to Drupal or the, you know, the, the association between uh, Symfony and Drupal, I will happily answer uh, them at the end of my talk. So today I want to talk, and yeah, this is the hashtag uh, you want to use on Twitter. So today I want to talk about the people working for the web. You, me, web developers, um, web designers, project managers. Um, you know, all those people who are probably passionate about their job, um, passionate enough, um, and also, uh, you know, those people have great responsibilities and 
they also have a unique opportunity to change the world um, and hopefully in good ways. So a lot of people keep asking me how I've learned everything I know. Um, how did I learn you know, how to code? Um, how did I learn about all the web development best practices, about all the best um, design patterns and so on? So that's a bit tough to, to explain, but my experience is probably not reproducible by, by everyone, but anyway, I want to share what worked for me. So to begin with, uh, you have to understand where I come from. I have no computer science degree per se, and anyway, I started to act computers when I was very, very young. So let me start with a story about how it all started with me, for me. It was Christmas, uh, 1984. So I was still very young. I was um, 11 years old at that time, and I had this one dream, getting my first real computer. And we were lucky enough to have some computers at school. At that time, it was not that widespread. But owning my own computer was one of my dreams. Oh, for the younger in the audience, you must know that the early 80s um, uh, was really the beginning of the computer, um, the personal computer area. So owning a computer at that time was, you know, uh, not that widespread, and just having access to a computer was not that easy at that time. And Santa Claus was kind enough to deliver a computer to me and my browsers for Christmas 1984. I got an Amstrad CPC 664. with a color monitor. <laughs> yeah. Amstrad computers were very popular at that time, at least in Europe, and um, the CPC um, 664 was probably one of the best computers available at that time, and I even had, it even had uh, an internal floppy disk drive. Yeah? Can you believe it? <laughs> yeah. You know, not a computer with you know, a regular cassette tape deck, but a real floppy disk. It was so fast. I was really in heaven. Um, and have a look at the keyboard. Even today, I, I find it beautiful, no? And actually, this is the only old computer I still have at home. Anyway, so we started to get it out of the box. Um, we removed everything from my desk in my bedroom. We plugged the screen and, uh, and the keyboard, and we were ready to try it out. We were so excited. After switching the machine on, now this is not a Windows blue screen of death. <laughs> uh, so here is what you had. This is the, the very first experience with the computer you had. Uh, I want to stop on this screen for a moment. By default, when booting the machine, you were on the command line, right? But more interestingly, you were able to start coding right away. You were able to type instruction directly. And thanks to the built-in you know, text editor, IDE, whatever, and the built-in basic language, and you can see you know, the line basic 1.1, it was built in. Um, yeah, it was really awesome. You didn't need any other software, no ID, no text editor, no compiler, nothing. Everything was built in. Just type your program, run it, debug it, and save it on disk. That was all. And as a matter of fact, the user manual was about 50 pages, and everything was very well explained. I read the, the, the book for, for this keynote, and it was really, really well made. Actually, it, it took me less than five minutes to relearn how to do what you just see on the screen. Yeah, I, I've done the demo. Uh, this, this is, um, you can do the same on cpcbox.com, but you know, I didn't have time to create a disk and format the disk, and, and um, yeah. So, um, and beside the basic language, you also had access to the logo language, where you, it was really easy you know, to draw lines and circles and, and so on. It was really very fun. 
Nowadays, when you buy a machine, getting ready to code is not that easy anymore. Uh, I think we need to learn something about that. How can we make the learning process easy and fun again? And recently, um, there have been some great initiatives uh, going on on that side. Uh, there is uh, codecademy.com, for instance. But I think that the new computer science section of the Khan Academy is uh, just awesome. By the way, uh, how many of you have already heard about the Khan Academy? Okay, not that many. So, the Khan Academy is the story behind the, the Khan Academy website is, is just amazing. One that proves that one person can change the world thanks to the web and is not even a web developer. So the founder, Cal, uh, Sal Khan, was working for an edge fund. And during his spare time, he was helping his cousins um, with math problems. Right? And at some point, because he was helping so many people in his uh, family, he started to record some videos and he posted them on YouTube right, so that everyone could watch them easily. And all the videos were public, actually. And more and more people started to watch those videos and he started to realize that he was onto something. But instead of creating a company, remember, he worked for a hedge fund, he created a non-profit organization instead. And that's the Ken Academy. Um, if you want to know more about how you got started um, and, and the old story, I highly recommend you to um, watch the video on TED. He, he did a talk on, on, on during the TED conference, so go to TED.com and it is quite interesting. So the Ken Academy announced a new computer science section, uh, a, I don't know, some days or weeks ago, and, and it's really awesome. Basically, it allows you to start coding in the browser with uh, JavaScript, and the experience is just amazing. With, you know, there is a video explaining everything, uh, the fact that you can you know, try everything out, you put your code on the left, you see the, the result on the right, um, so you have immediate feedback. So there is a small snippet of the first video. Let's start out by learning how to draw some basic shapes with code. It's really easy. If I want to draw a rectangle, for example, I can just type rect, which stands for rectangle, and it open parentheses, and then four numbers separated by commas, then close parentheses, and a semicolon. Ta-da! And if you're thinking, what the heck did she just do, then good. That means you're thinking. This thing right here is a function call. Now, a function is kind of like a special ability that your computer has. So, if you have a look at it, it is exactly the same experience I had more than 20 years ago with my Amstrad, right? The only difference is that I had a blue screen, now the screen is, is white. It was basic, it is JavaScript now, but this is exactly the same experience. I think this is a great initiative, and I think it can help a lot of young people get started faster with computers, and you know, without the hassle to install a lot of different things to be able to start coding. So, thanks to my Amstrad, I learned to code very early in my life, and it was quite easy to get started. But as far as I remember, becoming a programmer was never one of my dream jobs. I think it's because for me, uh, programming has always been about having fun, trying to solve problems, finding solutions to these problems, uh, learning new things, being able to make the machine do stuff for me. Um, I like, you know, challenges. I like to explore new worlds. So I've always seen writing code as a hobby and not really as a job. And when I grew up, I started to think about, you know, creating my own company uh, because being an entrepreneur was my dream job, actually. So that's what I did after school. I created my own company, which is about web development. Uh, and as such, I'm quite interested in understanding how people decide to choose um, a web-related job. From my experience as someone who hires a lot of uh, you know, web developers and, and project managers, uh, very few people actually wanted to do uh, a web-related job in the first place. At Sensio, we have 
people having so many different backgrounds. And that's very rewarding and really interesting. And a couple of days ago, I asked this question, the question about your dream job on, on Twitter. Um, but the question was targeted specifically for women. Why? Because they are underrepresented in our industry, and I don't really understand why this is the case. I mean, at least women are underrepresented in, in France, in Europe, probably in the US, and I know that this is not the case everywhere in the world. It's not. So this is probably, um, you know, related to some cultural issues. And if you ask me, we need more girls in our industry. We need more girls doing web-related stuff. <laughs> Why? You know, they have a different approach to solving problems. And that's a good thing. It helps a lot to have different points of view, different perspectives for the problems we have to solve. So, I got quite a few answers uh, to my question, and they were quite interesting. Uh, some, of course, were already interesting in doing, um, in working for the web, but the vast majority of them were dreaming of something else. And the most popular job seems to be astronaut. <laughs> yeah. That, that is quite surprising. And architect was also quite popular, and I think it kind of makes sense. You know, a good developer must also be a good architect. So, you work for the web, you are a freelancer, you are working for a big company, you are probably working for a small web shop, but you are all working for the web, and you are all using open source software, obviously. But why? Why have you chosen to work for the web, and why on earth? Have you chosen to work with open source software? I mean, this is a great choice, no question about it. But working for the web is not an easy job, that's for sure. Uh, the web is evolving at a very fast pace. Uh, the technologies are changing all the time. So this is a, a very demanding job with um, very few rewards. So because working for the web is so difficult and exhausting at times, I would even say that working for the web cannot be considered as a regular day job. Right? When I say day job, I mean something you do for the money, not necessarily for, um, because you love um, um, the, the job. And when you do something you know, only for the money, you tend to limit your involvement to what is required for the job to get done. And to be a good developer, you need to do a lot, really a lot. I'm also a web developer, but this is definitely not my job. I've been programming for the last 25 years because programming is my passion. And I think this is how it should be for everyone. Working for the web is more a passion than a job. If working for the web is just another job for you, you are going to be in trouble. I can tell you. Why? Because the web ecosystem evolves very fast. You know, in the old days, probably um, the first half of the last decade, developing a website was really easy. You had to learn some HTML, perhaps some MySQL and PHP, and, you know, that was really easy. And all things such websites was also straightforward. Install PHP, MySQL, Apache, done. Or, chose from the many Austin companies that provide the same for a very cheap price. But it was a time where you had limited choices and the majority of people chose the same stack anyway, the famous lump stack. And the bad news is that most of the time this is not true anymore. The web is becoming more complex every single day. And of course now you want to scale your website to under more traffic. You want to benefit from the latest innovation and the current best practices. So it was, you know, Ajax everywhere some years ago. It is about the web sockets nowadays. Uh, the rich client again with JavaScript, the possibility to under more than one devices, the DevOps movement, and so on. So we are now in a world 
where you need more techniques and more software, even for the simplest websites. And it's not going to stop. Quite the contrary. And that's why I love doing web development. It's great to be part of the web revolution. You can, and you probably should, literally learn something new every single day. This is really exciting. And of course, open source helps a lot here. It has never been easier to learn new stuff. It has never been easier to have a look at others' code and learn from it. And if we are talking about web design, I think this is the exact same story. The possibilities nowadays are you know, almost overwhelming. We started with a very simple, um, simple web pages. Yeah, we talked about pages uh, some years ago with a very limited HTML language. And now you can use videos, animation. It's all about HTML5, an explosion of devices, responsive design. And you still need to find innovative ways uh, to work around the many constraints the web still has, right? Even project management is evolving very fast. The way we worked some years ago is very different from the way we, we are working nowadays, right? And if you are still doing web projects the same way as before, uh, which is what is, you know, explained on the screen, you are in trouble. And your customers are in troubles as well. So if you don't want to constantly challenge yourself, if you are not willing to reinvent your job on a regular basis, yeah, then look for another job. The web is definitely not for you. So being a web developer must not be your dead job, but your passion. Really. Don't kill me. Um, here is a tweet from a couple of days ago during DrupalCon. Um, this is, yeah, kind of embarrassing, really. But I don't want to blame you, right? But not using a version control system when developing a website nowadays, well, this is a big no-no, right? It was not the case 10 years ago, but nowadays there is no question about it. You must use a version control system for all your projects and the good news is that we have awesome tools now. And the fact that many Drupal developers do not use version control system yet, not yet, is just another proof that keeping up with all the changes is really difficult. This is true for best practices, but also for the basics. Right? So time for a commercial now. I cannot speak at a conference without mentioning HTTP. Because the web, you know, would be nothing without the beauty and the power of the HTTP protocol. So I have the same question at every single session um, I do. How many of you have already read the HTTP specification? OK. So see, not that many. I know you are not all developers, but you know, everything you do with Drupal is powered by the HTTP protocol. And with Drupal 8, HTTP will become evo even more important for Drupal developers. So if you are a developer and if you have not read the HTTP specification yet, it's about time. Right? There is a lot of interesting stuff to learn here. And instead of reading the original specification, this is the first link, read the HTTPS document instead. Um, this is a write of the original specification. So it's not a new version of the uh, HTTP specification. This is still HTTP 1.1. But this document uh, clarifies the, the HTTP specification, and the organization is also much better. So you can read uh, just one chapter tonight and another one tomorrow and be done by the end of the week. I mean it, really. You, you should do. And I think that even you know, project managers uh, should read the HTTP specification, and at least very fast. But they, they, will, they, will, they will understand a lot of things by reading the, the, the specification. And if, if you are not a developer, and if you, you know, if you don't really understand how a web developer think, work, um, 
you, I, I recommend you do this book, um, Hackers and Painters. Um, it, 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 it's really a great book. And if you are, you are a developer, you can definitely read it also. So learning Git, running the HTTP specification, keeping up to date with everything takes a lot of time. And you probably don't have much time at work, right, for such activities. So this should mostly be done on your spare time, right? So the web is complex. The web evolves at a very fast pace. So keep learning. Right? To become a good developer, you need to learn a lot of things up front, that's for sure. But then you need to keep learning new things to stay up to date. You need to learn about you know, the new best practices, the new standards, the new software, the new technologies. But learning is not enough. You need to gain experience. And nothing can replace experience. Um, let me tell you another story. This is a sad story, uh, really, and um, it took place during August 2007 in Turkey. Emin, a 20 years old woman, and uh, Ramazan, a 24 years old man, were married, but they decided to split up. And as it happens quite frequently in such a situation, they kept having arguments over the cell phone, you know, sending text messages um, it, to each other, right? And that's a typical real-life situation. But at some point, Ramazan sent this text message to his ex-wife. It means, anyhow, whenever you can't answer an argument, you change the subject. Nothing special in the message. But notice that there is a mix between the high letter we all know about with a dot on top of it, but also some high letters without the dot. But as Ramazan's cell phone could not reproduce the high letter without the dot, right, he sent this message instead. The problem is that even if, you know, the message is quite the same, the dots added on top of the two I letters change the meaning quite radically. Now it means, and be warned, offensive language ahead. Anyhow, whenever they are fucking you, you change the subject. <laughs> and I don't have to explain why Emin, Emin was shocked when she received such a message. Right? But why in the first place? Ramazan did not anticipate it, this issue. Because for the meaning to be different, you also need to replace the last letter of the word from A to E. Right? So knowing that the vast majority of the cell phones in Turkey were not able to deal with the dotless I, and because it didn't change the ending of the word, he thought that the message was safe, right? But Emin read the message quickly, and she did not realize that she actually misinterpreted the meaning. So I said it was a sad, a sad story, and here is why. Shocked by the message, Emin showed it to her father, and the father angrily called Ramazan, and he accused him of calling his daughter a prostitute. So Ramazan went to his uh, wife's home to apologize and to explain the situation, but he was attacked by his wife, her father, and two sisters. He was stabbed in the chest, but he succeeded in grabbing a knife, stabbing his wife, and getting away. The father and the sisters were arrested and put in prison. Emin died. Um, of bleeding, and Ramazan killed himself in prison. That day, the lack of a single dot over a letter, caused by a tiny technological constraint, caused a chain of events that ended with very tragic consequences. 
And if you are thinking, well, it's only about cell phones in Turkey, so I'm not concerned at all, you're wrong. You're totally wrong. And as a matter of fact, if you have already worked on international websites, you know that localization is difficult. Time zones, parsing and displaying dates, parsing and displaying numbers, displaying currencies, etc. That's a lot to take care of. But that's the easy part, as, you know, if you don't get it right, it is easy to spot the issue and to fix them. And actually, the latest version of PHP gives you all the tools you need to uh, get it right. But the dot list I later is slightly different and kind of unique. And again, if you have already worked with, uh, on international website with some users in Turkey, you hit the issue at some point. It was probably a nightmare to identify the problem. Why? Because, you know, some random users, you think that it, it is about random users, they report that the website does not work at all for them, right? It works for you. It was for everybody. But some, you know, few users, it, it seems to not work for them. Then you have a look at the error logs. And you are not able to understand how is it even possible to have such random errors. It looks like they don't have the same code exhibited. How is it even possible, right? You have just experienced the Turkey issue. This is such a tricky issue that someone created a logo that you can use when your software pass, um, passes what it calls the Turkey test. So what is it about? This is because in Turkish, they really have two different I letters. One with a dot and one without a dot. Right? Two different letters. So let's see if PHP itself passes the Turkey test. Um, so let's say we have a user, the user is able to choose his local and he chooses Turkish. So this is the very first line here on the screen. And by the way, if you don't understand the code, no big deal. You will definitely be able to understand the consequences of the code. And if you are a developer, you can try this script at home. And then we have two lines and it is very easy. We have, uh, you know, two strings. We want the lowercase version of the first one and the uppercase version of the, of the second one. Right? And this is the output. Right? It's totally messed up, right? Doesn't make any sense. How is it even possible? And if you think that this is just, you know, a small annoying display issue, again, you're wrong. Try this now. So this is the same script. We have uh, the Turkish local. We create a new class, test it, and then we create a new instance of the class. Nothing fancy. And now, if you are not aware of the problem with Turkish, if you have not identified that the error only occurs when the user selects the Turkish local, you're lost. Why would a class not be found only randomly? That's because of the problem I've just explained. Right? By the way, the bug was reported uh, for PHP in 2002, and PHP is not the only uh, software to have this issue. And the good news is that a fix was actually merged about three months ago. Yeah. No comments on, on, on the fix itself. So, how many of you were aware of the Turkish issue? One, two, three, four. Four people, right? Okay, for the others, well, you have learned something new today. Good. <clears throat> so that's part of your experience, right? The web is still very young. It evolves very fast, but everything is not perfect yet. You must learn, you know, as many, as, you know, many uh, specificities of the web. And that's why I said you should learn something new every single day because there are a lot of them to learn, really. So hopefully, uh, next time you have a weird bug with, uh, you know, like a class that does not exist, only for some people, you will remember this talk. And if that ever happens, please send me a tweet. So, but this story also tells us something else. As people working for the web, web developers, web designers, or any other related job, web-related job, 
we have great responsibilities. Right? We are in charge of software that are used by millions of people. They are using our software to do their job, to do business, to help people. So try to not screw that up. Right? You need to get it right. Keep developing websites, gain experience. That, that, that's important. But there is something else you need to actually be a good web developer. This is the curiosity. You need to be curious to learn about you know, new, new practice, best practices, new standards, new software, new technologies. And you need to look around. Don't limit yourself to the community you know. Have a look at other languages. Have a look at other technologies. And as a matter of fact, Symfony is a full example where we borrowed some ideas from other frameworks written in many different languages. I'm sure this is exactly the same for Drupal. So for instance, in 2005, uh, I started to use YAML in Symfony for configuration files. And uh, because, you know, I used it a lot uh, when I was doing Perl. Um, and we are still using YAML for configuration files. And now Drupal 8 is also going to use YAML for configuration files. And Dries uh, uh, did a, a small demonstration of that during his keynote. But sometimes, Symfony borrowed ideas from technologies I've never, ever used myself. And most of the times, these things happen during conferences. Right? I'm speaking at many conferences around the world, but when attending a conference, I don't like drinking beers that much. I know this is probably not good to say that during conference happening in Munich, but yeah, that, that's the truth. Um, but I definitely love bookstores. So whenever I go, go to a conference, I need to visit a local bookstore. Even if, if I don't you know, speak the local language. I buy many books, uh, mostly technical ones. I love books. Sometimes I read them, sometimes I don't. The one in Japanese, for instance. Um, it doesn't matter. I need to buy books. And so four years ago, I was attending the MySQL conference in the US. and. Uh, as always, I, will, I was looking for um, a good book to read. I stumbled upon this book about Spring. Spring is a Java framework. So I've never learned Java. I've never written a single line of Java. But the book looked interesting, and I was curious about how Spring solved web problems. Uh, by the way, Greg Walsh is a great author. And he explained things in a very easy way. So after reading the book, I grasped dependency injection and why you would need a dependency injection container. If you don't understand what a dependency injection container, doesn't matter. And at that time, I was working on yet another Symfony 2 prototype. I was pretty happy with everything. But you know, I was this something that annoyed me a lot, how to manage dependencies within the code. So I read this book. And suddenly, you know, everything became clear in my mind. What I needed was a dependency injection container. So I, I read the book in one fell swoop, and two hours later, I started to code my very first dependency injection container prototype. I started to dig the Java code. I got inspiration from the Java code. And a few days later, it was ready. Um, a fully featured dependency injection container written in PHP based on the spring IDs. Of course, the code was much different from the Java one, but the concepts were similar, uh, and the names too. So instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, I based my solution on a proven one, one that has been popular for so many years in another language. Of course, the concept had been adapted to the PHP world, but the solution for the problem I had you know, is it, quite similar. And since then, I've tried to evangelize um, um, my new knowledge. And I've, I, I talked about a dependency injection during, um, in many conferences. And as a matter of fact, nowadays, almost all major PHP frameworks are looking into using a dependency injection container uh, for their next version. And Drupal 8 is no exception. Yes, there is some Java framework philosophy embed into Drupal 8. That's scary, yeah, I know. So this is my advice. Drink less beers, read more code, read more books.
seriously, uh, be curious, benchmark, have a look around, right? Also because, you know, people do not realize that developing website is still a challenge. There are so many things that can go wrong. We still have problems with, you know, compatibility between browsers. We can have hosting issues, scalability, uh, multi-device support, uh, performance, stabilities, um, bugs everywhere, requirements changing all the time. Uh, so many things are not ready yet for prime time, right? So we do, do call our industry, you know, computer science, but in reality, we are still craftsmen. Right? Our websites are still and made. Craftsmen who are changing the world, changing all the other industries one at a time, but we have not built our own industry yet. We are craftsmen, but we should also be artists, I think. Because you also learn a lot by experimenting, trying new things, stupid things. Um, I like ch challenges. I like, you know, to push the limits. Uh, it helps me learn new concepts, and it started very early. In 1990, in 1990, a program of mine was published in a French magazine. It was a challenge and an interesting experiment for me. Uh, it was about coding a full game in less than 10 lines of code, right? And at that time, you had a limit uh, for each line of code. Um, this is the first line. Well, frankly, I have no idea, uh, you know, what it does. Um, I, I have, I've tried to, you know, it does not, does not make any sense anymore. But this was my first published uh, code ever and probably my first free piece of software. I'm really proud of that. Um, and from time to time, I still do, you know, some experiments. Some years ago, I, I, I did some experiment with Twitter. I wanted to see if it was possible to embed a fully working program in a tweet written in PHP, which is, you know, really a challenge because PHP is really verbose. So my first successful attempt uh, was a framework that fits in a tweet. So this is a, a framework, an MVC framework. Not really, now we don't have the view, actually. Um, so yeah, PHP is the view, so we have an MVC framework here. And later on, I also publish, published a dependency injection container that fits in a tweet. So if you don't know uh, what a dependency injection container is, this is it. It was not really serious, you know, uh, but I wanted to prove that it was at least possible to do something like that. I also wanted to prove that, you know, the big names we have for uh, design patterns, uh, all the names we give to some concepts like, you know, frameworks, dependency injection container, are actually much simpler that, uh, than what most of us think. And it also helps to make a difference between a concept and an implementation, right? Oh, I like this one. Uh, I'm not the only one to have uh, fun with code. Some time ago, someone opened an issue on the Twitter bootstrap project on GitHub. He had a problem um, when using JS mean uh, on the bootstrap code, you know, to minify the, uh, the code. Uh, yeah, bootstrap is, is written in JavaScript and it was not working. So apparently the developers of bootstrap do not like the semicolon, right? So for aesthetic preferences, I think. Uh, so they don't use them, right? So you have two lines of code, there is no semicolon at, at the end. And this is totally valid in JavaScript, but sometimes you need to put a semicolon to avoid ambiguities. And so the bug was closed uh, pretty fast, but Douglas Crockford started a flame war in the commands for this issue when he said, that is insanely stupid code. Learn to use semicolons properly. And then many people started to give their opinions and things uh, got out of control pretty fast. As you can see, more than 200 um, comments on, on this single issue. Uh, it was closed right away. But the interesting part is that someone found a discussion about the semicolon quite funny, and he created a new language <laughs> where the only valid characters are semicolons and spaces. If you don't understand the code, this is a way to print hello world. 
Actually, it works. So, be curious. Try new things. Explore new worlds. Have fun. Don't stay in your comfort zone. Right? I would even say, do reinvent the wheel. Just to understand how things work. Do create your own CMS. Do create your own framework. But please, be pragmatic. Don't use them for commercial work. <laughs> I mean, most of the time. Um, yeah, you know, most of the time, the things you, are, you create are, are, are not robust enough, uh, even if they are extremely valuable from a, a learning experience. So sometimes using, you know, using custom code uh, to solve a problem is, is easier, right? You have something to solve, and you, you just write some code, JavaScript, PHP, whatever, just works. Um, and it's probably easier than learning existing libraries and frameworks and CMSs. But it's always a great learning experience and much better to actually learn how things are done by uh, authors. Right? Oh, remember this? How many of you have already used Netscape 2.0? Wow, you are old. <laughs> okay, so... Um, so, working for the web is difficult, but at the same time, we are very lucky because we understand how the web works, right? Um, so, yeah, you are old enough, so you, so, you know, you, you um, grew with the web. Um, so, most of us followed all the incremental changes, you know, on the web. Um, and... The web, you know, some years ago it was just about HTML, static pages, and, and, and that was all. Uh, now we have more complex ones. So if I, I start to talk about POP, SMTP, RSC, Jabber, whatever, you are going to understand what I'm talking about. It, was, it is probably not the case for the elders, I mean, our parents. And it is probably not the case anymore for the younger. You know, at least the barrier of entry is gigantic for them, right? I think this is a problem. There is a disconnect between people who know us and the ones who don't know. And, you know, most of you probably think that the younger people are feeling comfortable when browsing the web. I'm not so sure. Many people just do not make any difference between the internet, the web, a browser, an address bar, Google or Facebook, right? Uh, if you don't believe me, let me tell you a story. You've, you've probably heard about this one. Uh, in early 2010, uh, Red Web published an article on Facebook, and the title was, Facebook wants to be your one true login. Uh, the article itself was uh, about a deal on AOL and Facebook, and, but that's not the interesting part. Less than an half an hour, um, after the publication, the number of visitors on this article started to grow significantly. And after just an hour, the article reached the number of visitors an average uh, article might see in an entire day. So something strange was happening. And the comments on the article itself looked really weird and totally disconnected from the contents of the article, a deal between AOL and Facebook. Why won't you, you let me sign in? All I wanted to do was log into my Facebook account. I don't like this new way. I need your Facebook. This one is very bad. And hundreds of similar comments. What was going on? If you want to log in on Facebook, you probably open a browser, you type facebook.com in the address bar, right? Easy enough. Or you created a bookmark for it, so that it is easy to access. But apparently, many people do not do this. Instead, they go to Google, they tap, type Facebook login in the search box, and then 
they blindly click on the first result. <laughs> yeah. But that day, Google thought that the Read Bright Web article was the most relevant page for the login Facebook keywords. And so it was first in the result page. So people are using a search tool, Google, as a navigation tool, as a bookmarking tool. Sounds scary, yes? Yes, it is. So at some point, a website had to add this small text to explain the situation to visitors. <laughs> this site is not Facebook. This is a website called Read Wild Web that reports on news about Facebook. Right? To access Facebook right now, click here. For future reference, type facebook.com into your browser address bar. We recommend that you then save Facebook as a bookmark in your browser. But unfortunately, to understand that text, you need to know what a browser is, what an address bar is, and what a bookmark is. So people did not figure out that it was a blog post about Facebook, not Facebook itself. Well, even if we have a quick look at the page, it looks pretty obvious, no? The logo, the colors, it cannot be Facebook. So people get stuck pretty easily. And as web developers, we have huge responsibilities. We make the world work or not. We have the power to make things easy or complicated. I'm talking about web developers, but I think this is really about all the people working on the web, for the web. You know, the web designers responsible for uh, designing user interfaces. Uh, even project manager, I think. So you see, don't believe me that this is a large number of people. You, you probably thinking, yeah, this is just a small proportion of the population. It cannot be true. Um, here is a video recorded by Google in 2009. Hey, this is Scott from Google. We're here in Times Square, New York, to find out what is a browser. A website that you can search on, I think. I call it the search engine. That's what I call it, the browser. What is a browser? Um, browser is a search engine. Browser. I say search engine. Browse. What? It's where I search through, like to find things. It's, it's where you put your search terms, correct? What is a browser? Google. <laughs> <laughs> what else? <laughs> uh, browsers would use to look at internet web pages. What is a browser? What is a browser? Uh, I use the Yahoo. No, is that not a browser? Do you know what the difference is between a search engine and a browser? Well, not exactly. I mean, no. I don't know. I guess the internet is just where you, you know, find anything, and I guess you browse the same way. Hell, I know. Man. <laughs> a browser is when you know what you're looking for, and a search engine is when you're searching for something. I assume a browser is the way to get on, but uh, no, I don't know much. So, do you know what the difference is between Google and your browser? Um, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> what browser do you use? I use uh, Firefox. What made you switch to Firefox? My friend came over to my house and erased all my other browsers and installed it instead of using this one. What browser do you guys use? Google. I have uh, AOL. We go through um, uh, broadband. The big E with the Explorer out there. <laughs> I'm not a computer guy. I might be the wrong one for this. <laughs> what browser do you guys like to use? We use Google. I use Google. I, Google predominates the market, obviously, but uh, occasionally I like to go to Yahoo just to give them some business. Yeah, I uh, use uh, Internet Explorer and Mozilla Firefox. Oh, uh, is that the, your internet browser? Uh, <laughs> help! Have you heard of uh, Google's browser, Chrome? No, I haven't. No. C-H-R-O-M-E? No. What is that? Crown? No, I have not. Have you heard of Google's Chrome browser? No. Should I use it? Have you heard of Google's Chrome browser? Chrome browser? Uh-uh. No way. 
less than 8% of people who were interviewed in this day knew what a browser was. 8% of the people. Yeah, scary things. A recent analysis of 1.3 billion web pages revealed that more than 20% of them contain Facebook links. Right? So Google used to be the browser for most people. Now Facebook is becoming the browser. It's the people's viewport to the web. Right? So next time you go home for holidays, if you think that your mom is still bad at computers, help her. Teach her something new every single day. What is a spam? What is the difference between internet and the web? Between Facebook and a browser? Why she must not give their password after clicking on a link in an email? <laughs> or why she won't get nine million dollars from someone she does not know in Africa? <laughs> so working for the web is not a dead job. It is a passion. It is a challenge. It is exciting. But there's another outcome. It opens up huge opportunities as everything is in the process of being reinvented thanks to the web. 30 years ago, the internet was just a network um, for experts. Today, more than 2 billion people are connected to the internet. Right? And according to a report from uh, McKinsey Global Institute, the internet accounted for more than 20% of the GDP growth in mature economies about, uh, in, the fast, in the past five years. Right? More interesting, McKinsey found that there is direct connection between the maturity of the internet ecosystem and the rising of living standards. Right? Over the past 15 years, and thanks to the internet, the GDP per individual increased by 500 dollars in advanced countries. And it took 50 years uh, for the industrial revolution to achieve the same results. As you can imagine, this is particularly relevant for developing economies. This demonstrates the positive impact of the internet and the speed at which it um, delivers them. And that's because everything around us is turning into a computer. Your phone is a computer, your camera, your television, your car, your fridge. You name it. And mostly everything you do now involves a computer. Reading a newspaper, reading a book, um, booking a hotel room, uh, playing games, uh, buying food, uh, listening to music. And all those things you can do on a computer are mostly possible thanks to the internet. Internet is probably uh, the biggest revolution ever. Right? And so the, instant, the internet is changing um, the world one industry at a time. Uh, but I believe that most innovations on the internet are not driven by big corporations like Google, Apple, uh, Microsoft, whatever. I believe that the major changes of our world are initiated by uh, people who are passionate enough to do big things. And most of the time, they are people like you, people who understand the web. Um, the internet is a great enabler, really. It is still possible for one person to change the world, or at least to be, you know, part of major changes. I won't talk about, you know, Wikipedia or one laptop for chat and, and all the great initiatives we have thanks to the internet. And today, I just want you to, you know, to make you realize that you can be part of these radical changes. If you think that something should be changed, if you're, you know, if you like a specific existing initiative, please try to contribute. You, you are already contributing to, to Drupal, and Drupal itself is a contribution to these changes. But if you think about it a bit more, you realize that this revolution is heavily based on open source software. A lot of what has been done in the last year is powered by open source software. So as an individual, but also as a community, you are in the best position to make the world um, a better place. And of course, this is just the beginning. A lot of innovation are, you know, ahead of us. The internet is still in um, its early days. 
So the internet is changing the way we work, the way we socialize, create, and share information, and yet we are still in the early days of uh, uh, this great revolution. Being a good developer is a lot of hard work. It comes with huge responsibilities, but it also puts you in the best position um, to benefit from the big opportunities the internet creates. And when I say benefit, I'm not talking about, you know, getting rich. Uh, even that might be a nice side effect. I'm talking about making the world a better place at your own scale. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.